Hello, good afternoon, welcome back. Today we're gonna to talk about what I call the infectious cycle. What do I mean by that? Here's a schematic of a cell and it is infected with a virus and it goes through a number of stages. So virologists divide this infectious cycle into parts to make it easier to study. And of course, in real life, things don't happen in stages, they all overlap, but we tend to divide it into stages to facilitate study. And in fact, many people focus on one part of the re reproduction cycle. So the infectious cycle is all the events that go on in a cell from the beginning of infection to the end when new virus particles are made. Sometimes I'll call it the reproduction cycle. Those two phrases are interchangeable. But they comprise, and the first a dozen or so lectures in this course will talk about these steps. They attach viruses attaching to receptors on the cell surface. The virus is getting into the cell and releasing their nucleic acid. Uh, and that varies depending on what kind of nucleic acid is present in the virus, as you'll see. Uh, messenger RNAs have to be made, which are translated and give rise to proteins. The genomes have to be re replicated. You have to make more genomes. And then at the end, you assemble new virus particles and they are released from cells. So that's the entire replication cycle in a cell culture. And this, of course, is part of what goes on in an infected animal. Infected animal is way more complicated and we'll talk about that in the second half of the course because there are things like anatomical differences, tissue differences, immune responses, and so forth to deal with. But for now, we're gonna focus on viruses reproducing in cells. And what I wanna to do today is talk about the methods that we use to study how viruses replicate or reproduce in cells in culture. And I need to give you some terms right at the onset to make sure you understand when I use a word, what it means. Um, you have to be precise in science. You can't use a word in lecture two and then in lecture 12 use the same word and mean something different that is i learned that from the textbook writing the textbook you have to use the same definition for a term throughout the textbook so here are some very important ones and their their meanings are specific to virology you know these words have uses in the english english language of course but for virology they're very specific so a susceptible cell when I say a cell is susceptible to a virus, I mean it has a receptor that the virus can bind to to get into the cell. That's all it means. It, it implies nothing about subsequent steps in the infectious cycle. Now, a resistant cell has no receptor. Very simple, susceptible, resistant, may or may not be competent to support viral replication. And you may be thinking, well, how would you know if the virus can't get in. We'll, we'll see more about that later, but the short answer is you can take nucleic acid out of a virus particle and introduce it into cells, bypass the entire receptor-dependent entry, and ask whether a cell can support virus replication. The third term reflects that, permissive. A permissive cell is the cell that can replicate virus. It may or may not be susceptible. So if you take nucleic acid of a virus, introduce it into a cell, and it can in initiate an infectious cycle, that cell is permissive. And finally, a susceptible and permissive cell is the one that can complete the entire infectious cycle from binding to a receptor through reproduction in the cell to the production of new virus particles. So I use these terms very specifically and for the rest of the course, when I use them, you'll, you'll understand what I mean. Now, these terms are not even un universal among virologists, in fact. Some of my colleagues don't use them properly. But this is how I will use them in this course. Now, last time we heard about virus discovery. Uh, the first viruses, well, tobacco mosaic virus discovered at the end of the 1800s. And then slowly, more and more viruses were discovered. But for the next 50 years, it was really difficult to study viruses because no one could grow cells in culture reproducibly. And so people used animals or plants to study their viruses. And here are some of the hosts that people used over the years to study uh, viruses. 
And in fact, there were no cell cultures. There were no freezers for a good part of the beginning of the 1900s. You had what we called ice boxes. I didn't, I say we, but I never used an ice box. But you'd buy ice and put it in this thing that looked like a refrigerator and it kept cold whatever you wanted. But of course, for biological specimens, you couldn't freeze them. So how did you keep a virus stock? You infected an animal. You'd wait a certain amount of time. You'd sacrifice the animal, grind up a tissue, and inject that into another animal. So you maintained your virus stocks in living animals all the time. And that led to problems, of course, because you're continuously passing the virus from host to host, often not actually the natural host of the virus. So that complicated the study of virology. Uh, and eventually we developed freezers so we could freeze viruses at some point. And then at some point we developed cell cultures. Now, early on, it was discovered that you could grow some viruses in embryonated chicken eggs. You, you allow a hand to fertilize, to, to uh, lay an egg, and it's fertilized. And um, the little embryo that grows inside it, it makes a suitable environment for some viruses to grow. And on here, you can see different parts of the egg where you can inject viruses and get viruses of different sorts to reproduce. For so example, you could inject cells right into the amniotic cavity, the, the amniotic cavity which surrounds the embryo. Then there's an allantoic cavity around it. Uh, you can in, inoculate it to different membranes. We don't use this anymore today except for one virus, uh, influenza virus, because it gives lots of very high yields of uh, influenza viruses. And in fact, uh, some of the influenza vaccines that we still use are propagated in embryonated chicken eggs. And people who work on influenza also still use eggs to grow up virus stocks. But for other viruses, we don't use them anymore. But for many years, it was a very convenient animal host uh, in which to grow viruses. Uh, the influenza vaccines, by the way, are produced at great numbers globally. And there are automated ways to inject these eggs you have to drill a hole in the shell, and then you st stick a needle into it and, and inoculate it with virus, and you have to seal it over so it doesn't leak. And this has now been automated by machines that can do 50 to 60,000 eggs an hour, and that's how we make millions and millions of doses of influenza vaccine every year. And in the 1950s, really important discovery for virology uh, made by three individuals, Enders, Weller and Robbins working at Harvard Medical School. This is John Enders. Uh, one of the, I think one of, the, one of the three was a medical student, another was a fellow, and they figured out how to grow cells in culture, and then they showed that they could be infected with polioviruses. Now these were what we call primary cultures. Uh, they took cells and dissociated them and they grew in culture uh, and then they were able to infect them and show that the virus could propagate. This was such an important discovery that these three individuals got the Nobel Prize in 1954. John Enders made the cover of Time magazine with little poliovirus particles behind him. They don't look like viruses, they look like bits of stone to me, but it's good to be on the cover of Time. Uh, and this revolutionized virology because from that point on, people started to learn how to make cell cultures and use them to grow viruses. Today, we use cell cultures extensively. We still use animals to study disease, but we use cell cultures to grow our viruses in. And typically, we have three different kinds of cell cultures. We have primary cell cultures. You take a tissue, you chop it up and digest it to single cells. You put it on a plastic dish with medium, the cells will attach and they will grow out. We call them primary because we make it from a tissue. And foreskin is commonly used to make primary cell lines because you can go into any hospital and get foreskins every day because they're just thrown away, as you know. But there are other tissues that you can get as well after surgery. These happen to be foreskin. In the middle, we have a cell line. Cell lines are immortal. They grow forever. You can keep dividing them and dividing them in your lab, and they will keep growing, uh, whereas primary cells will die after 20 to 30 doublings. Um, and so here, for example, is a famous mouse fibroblast cell line 3T3. Another famous uh, 
immortal cell line are the HeLa cells made from human epithelial cells. So those are two cell lines. And then we have some diploid cell strains like WI38. Now these immortal cells are highly abnormal. They have all sorts of properties that differ from normal cells. We'll actually talk about that a bit later. They have the wrong number of chromosomes. Uh, they have all kinds of issues with them, but they are very useful as long as you know the limitations. And we grow lots of cells in our laboratory. Here's our incubator. Uh, we grow cells in plates like this, six centimeter plates, uh, six well plates, flasks of all different sizes. These are growing all different kinds of cells that we use for virus propagation. And these, the, virus, the cells are growing on the plastic. You can see there's a thin layer of cell culture medium covering the cells. The cells attach to the plastic. And when they reach a certain density, we use them to do our infections. Uh, some kinds of cells can be grown in a different way. They can be grown in suspension. If you need large amounts of cells, large volumes, millions and millions of cells, you grow them in a flask like this. The cells are suspended in this medium. And you can see there's a little magnet in there that spins. And on this whole flask it sits on top of a, a, a uh, apparatus with a motor in it that spins another magnet. So this is always spinning, this is kept warm, and the cells divide. And this can give you millions and millions and millions of cells, far more than you can get with growing them on plates. Unfortunately, not every cell type will grow in suspension, so it's limited, and these happen to be HeLa cells. Now, HeLa cells, of course, uh, were de devised from Henrietta Lacks in the 1950s. Uh, this young lady uh, had a cervical tumor uh, for which she went to Johns Hopkins Hospital to be treated. The surgeons took a piece of her tumor and it turned out to be the first cell line that grew it forever. It was immortal. Uh, it was the first human cell line, HeLa cells. And um, she died a few years later and her family didn't even know that her cells had been growing. The whole story is told, of course, in the book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Uh, anybody read this? I'm sure some of you have. It's really interesting. And when Rebecca Skloot was writing this uh, a number of years ago, she was searching and she came across a blog post that I had written about HeLa cells. And so we ended up uh, corresponding and she gave me versions of the manuscript to check for scientific accuracy, which, which I did. Um, and you'll find me mentioned at the end of the book if you've read this. But it's a really good account for, for, uh, of this and now, of course, um, the family found out about it many years later, and this tells the story of all that. But HeLa cells were the first human cell line to be immortal, uh, and mouse cell lines, the 3T3, were, was another one. And now we know how to make immortal cells in many ways. Cell lines have gone now way beyond cell lines, whereas, you know, for many years, virologists studied virus infectious cycles in simple cells in culture. We now can make almost organs in cell culture dishes, what we call organoids. And here are just some ways that we can do that. We, we can start off with stem cells. And as many of you know, we can get stem cells in two broad ways. We can take them out of a blastocyst, the inner cell mass, take them out in a stem cell, will become any kind of cell under the right conditions. Or you can take a somatic cell, a skin cell, and put in just a couple of genes turn it into an induced pluripotent stem cell, and then these can be uh, induced under the right conditions with the right growth factors and so forth to become different organoids. So you can see here stomach organoids, intestinal, liver, thyroid, lung, eye, uh, brain organoids, pituitary, inner ear. People are figuring out how to do this for every tissue and organ. Of course, these don't completely reproduce the organ because they lack immune systems, they often lack circulation, but people are f trying to figure out how to do that. And the neat part is you can infect them and see where the virus is multiplying and what it does to the tissue. So it's a really an advance over cell cultures. It's just short of a whole animal, of course, but it gives you a lot of flexibility in the kinds of experiments you can do. On the right is another kind of culture uh, and we've been interested in both of these in the lab. On the right, an air-liquid interface culture. As we'll see, must, much of our 
uh, the body has, is comprised of mucosal membranes, our alimentary tract, our respiratory tract, et cetera, which is lined with epithelial cells which are exposed to the environment. And viruses infect those cells quite often, and we can now make cells that approximate that air-liquid interface. So what you do is you take some uh, lung cells, these can be from mice or humans, and you put them in a typical cell culture medium, on top of a membrane, instead of on plastic, you put them on a porous membrane and they're surrounded with cell culture medium. You let them grow and become confluent, which means they touch one another. Then you remove the medium. You basically expose them to the air, which is the way they normally uh, survive in the animal. You have medium underneath them and they differentiate into a pseudostratified epithelium to look a lot like say the respiratory tract if you use respiratory cells. So then you can infect them with viruses and see what they do. So this is really revolutionizing the way we study viruses. So let's go to the first quiz question. A blank and blank cell is the only cell that can take up a virus particle and replicate it. So fill in the blanks. It could be naive and resistant primary and permissive, susceptible and permissive, susceptible and naive, continuous and immortal. Susceptible and permissive, that's correct. So cells have to be susceptible, they have receptors, and permissive meaning internally they can support the replication of a virus, and that is the one that will take it up and replicate it. So we have cells in culture in which we can grow our viruses now, and let's talk about how we can detect the viruses that are growing there. First of all, how do we know when we put virus on our cell cultures that they're actually infected and they're making virus? So one of the ways is very simple. We can look at the cells in a light microscope and ask, are there changes taking place in the cells that are caused by virus infection? And those changes we call cytopathic effect. So cytopathic means the cells are, being, are having pathology or they're being altered in some way. And here's an example of a cytopathic effect. Uh, here on the upper left is a culture of fibroblasts. They're growing in a monolayer. They're infected with poliovirus. And this is time zero on the upper left. You can see the lovely monolayer of cells. They're all touching one another. The plastic is completely covered. And now, uh, a few hours later, maybe three or four hours later on the right, you can see there's some differences. Some of the cells are now rounded up. You go to the lower left, eight hours after infection, now all the cells pretty much have come off the monolayer, they're rounded up and floating in the medium, and on the right, uh, 12 hours, many of the cells have broken. We call that lysis. So this is an example of cytopathic effect. The rounding up, detachment of cells from a monolayer and eventually their death. And not all viruses do this. There's a whole range of cytopathic effects that are carried out by viruses, but we can use them to detect infected cultures. Now there are some viruses that will give zero cytopathic effects at the level of a light microscope, and then you have to do something else in order to measure reproduction. And here's an example of a different kind of cytopathic effect. This is the formation of what we call syncytia. So syncytia is plural, syncytium would be the singular, and all that means is fused cells. So here we have a culture of cells infected with a paramyxovirus, like measles virus, and these typically cause fusion of cells, and what you see in the light micrograph, you can see individual cells remaining, these little spheres, but you can also see some giant cells. The arrow points to one giant cell, and you can barely see it at multiple nuclei, here, here, and here, and here. So that is a cell that has resulted from the fusion of four or five or six cells, and that's a syncytium right there. And you can see multiple syncytia in that cultures, in this culture. When measles was prevalent, you could take and from the inside of a child's mouth who you suspected to have measles, there are little white dots called coplic spots. You could take a little swab of those, put them on a microscope, and see syncytia in those cultures. And, and that would give you a clue that it was most likely measles virus. What's happening here 
is that these viruses are infected. They are producing on the cell surface uh, viral glycoproteins, which we'll talk about in greater detail later. Those are shown in red. The viral glycoproteins attach to receptors on neighboring cells, and those cells then fuse. This is how the virus normally gets into an infected cell, but when the cell produces the glycoprotein on the surface, the result is fusion and eventually a giant syncytium. So that's another kind of cytopathic effect. Now here's a table of many others. I don't want you to, to learn these at all. I just want you to know that there are different cytopathic effects depending on the particular virus. And many of these can be seen in the light microscope. In fact, that's how uh, they were discovered. So for example, morphological alterations. Um, we, we have syncytium formation, which I've just illustrated uh, for you, rounding up and detachment of cultured cells. And on the right are the viruses that do each one, uh, vacuoles in the cytoplasm, et cetera. And then many viruses make what we call inclusion bodies in the cell. And these can be in the nucleus or the cytoplasm. And they're usually sites of virus assembly. So late in the infectious cycle, as viral components are coming together, they form new virus particles. And they typically, this typically happens in very discrete places. And we see them as inclusion bodies. In fact, many of these were discovered years before we knew anything about virus reproduction. For example, uh, Negri bodies were, were uh, noted by an Italian pathologist years ago in people who had rabies. And we later learned that these were the sites of uh, assembly of the subviral particles. So many viruses do different things, as you can see here. And these are another way that you can use to detect viruses in cells. But more, more likely, we would like to know how many viruses are in a tube. So if you infect cells with a virus and the, the, the cells go through the entire cycle, you, you want to take what comes out and measure the virus infectivity. So here, I took this picture in my lab a few months ago. Well, these are tubes full of virus samples. And if I said to you, tell me how much virus is in these, well, you'd do some of the assays that I'm going to tell you about now. We can do two kinds of assays. We can do infectivity assays. I can tell you exactly how many infectious virus particles there are in the sample. Or we can measure physical particles in assays that do not measure infectivity. And they're very different because only the infectivity assay, of course, tells you if there are infectious viruses in a sample. And why that's important, we'll talk about it later. So the first assay I want to discuss and explain in terms of how it works is the plaque assay. A plaque is one of these circles on this plate. And that's where the assay got its name. It was first developed by virologists working on viruses of bacteria, bacteriophages. Uh, and it was developed in the 1930s. And what you do here is you have a lawn of bacteria growing on an auger plate. And um, mixed with the lawn, before it was plated out, are dilutions of what you think are bacteriophages. And as they reproduce in the bacteria and kill them, they make clearings, these little clear circles. And those are plaques, of course. And that's what gave it the name. Uh, and this was used initially to study as I said, bacteriophages. It's a quantitative assay. Each plaque arises from a single infectious virus. So you can express infectivity in terms of plaque forming units per mil. And I'll tell you how we can do that. Of course, the animal virologist did not want to be left behind. And so in 1952, uh, a virologist, Renato Del Becco, developed the plaque assay for animal viruses. He, he took the lead of the bacteriophageologists, of course, and he said, I can do this for animal viruses. And he published uh, this paper in 1952. He was at Caltech at the time. Production of plaques in monolayer tissue cultures by single particles of an animal virus. So by then, we had figured out how to grow cells in monolayers. Otherwise, none of this would have been possible. Uh, and the, this single particle, let's, we're going to come back to that. I'm going to explain how he could make uh, that statement. So here is um, a picture from this early paper of plaques. They're not so great. I'll show you some better ones that we've done lately. But this began the whole ability to do really serious manipulation of animal viruses. Now here's how a plaque assay works. I have to tell you, 
This is my favorite assay in the world. I think there is no better assay. It's the most brilliant, most informative assay ever developed. If you want to tell me about something else, I'll listen. But in the end, there's nothing better than this because it tells you how many infectious viruses are present. It's easy to do, and it's beautiful. So here's how it works. You have a tube of virus. I say, tell me how many viruses are in that tube. So you make dilutions. You make tenfold serial dilutions. You take 0.1 ml, you mix it with 0.9 of, of saline, and then you take another mill and you, you go down the line. So you have tenfold serial dilutions, minus one, two, three, four, et cetera. And then you take some of the higher dilutions and you take another 0.1 ml and you plate it out onto a monolayer of cells. Now, that 0.1 ml, of course, is another tenfold dilution. You take your cells growing in plates, you remove the medium, you add a small volume of your virus, you let the viruses adsorb, attach to the cells for about an hour, and then you, you add a semi-solid overlay, like an agar-containing overlay. And that's really important because any viruses that are released from the cells, they are restricted by the agar. They don't just spread throughout the culture and kill all the cells, but they make foci. That's the whole point, of course, of a plaque assay. And after an incubation period, you can remove the agar gently. You can stain the cells. You use a stain that stains the living cells. So now wherever cells have been killed by the virus, you have clearings. You have little round clearings, which are plaques, of course. And then you can count them. Uh, usually you do a range of dilutions because you'll get too many on some plates and not enough to be accurate on others. And here we have 17 plaques. And it's very easy to determine the, the plaque count, the PFU per mil, because all you do is you multiply 17 times the dilution. So here it would be 17 times 10 to the seventh PFU per mil, and I've just moved the decimal point over one, so it's 1 1.7 times 10 to the eighth PFU per mil. Incredible simplicity, no math really involved. You just take the final dilution, and don't forget that last 0.1 ml. So a little information on how this works. What happens is when you infect your cell monolayer with a virus, uh, let's take a look at a very small area of the cell monolayer here. One cell will be infected by a virus, and that cell will be killed. So you can see it's, it's a blank spot on the monolayer. The cell is gone, and that cell has released new virus particles. Because we've used an agar overlay, they will only infect neighboring cells. And that zone of killing will get bigger and bigger until you can see it and stain it. So it's really important to put a semi-solid overlay on. If you put a liquid overlay on, the virus is coming out of that first cell, would spread throughout the culture just by diffusion, and they would kill all the cells, and you couldn't count foci. So the agar allows you to have foci. Not all, not all viruses make plaques. I feel so badly for people who work on viruses that don't form plaques. But you can get around that in many ways. Here on the bottom is a herpes virus, which doesn't form great plaques, although if you zoom in in the light microscope on a single plaque caused by a herpes virus, that's shown here, you can see that the cells are different within the zone of infection right there. And this particular herpes virus had a, dye, a gene that would make a blue dye encoded in the genome. So you can see you could stain the monolayer and see plaques. So there are other ways that you can do plaque assays even if the viruses don't kill cells. Now I think the next uh, is a movie of plaque formation. And this is a time-lapse photograph. Someone did a plaque assay, found a focus, and then put their camera on it and took frames every so many hours. This covers like 15 hours. And you can see the cells slowly changing as the virus spreads from the middle through circles, through circles around that initial focus and out and out. It's almost like you drop a pebble in the water and it ripples out where the virus infects cells in the middle. And then you can see this is under a, a, a phase contrast microscope. So the infection is altering the cells so that their phase contrast is changing. They become refractory to light. And you can trace the spread of the virus. It's really remarkable how uh, symmetrically the virus spreads outwards. Greatest movie ever made in my opinion. So in my, we do a lot of plaque assays in my lab. And one year, a postdoc of mine did 
a plaque assay with 1,656 well plates. And after she was done, I said, you, sh you should keep them. So she did, and many years later, I built this wall in my office, uh, which we call the wall of polio, because these are polio plaque assays. And when you come for office hours, you will see this. And these are some students from last year who uh, did the traditional thing to have their photograph taken and become immortalized in front of the wall of polio virus. <laughs> so we do like plaque assays. Next question is when doing a plaque assay, what's the purpose of adding a semi-solid solid agar overlay on the monolayer of infected cells? To stabilize progeny virions, to ensure that the cells remain susceptible and permissive, to act as a pH indicator, to keep cells adherent to the plate, to restrict viral diffusion after lysis of infected cells. The right answer, of course, is E, to restrict viral diffusion after lysis of infected cells. So, so most of you got that, but a good fraction said D, to keep cells adherent to the plate. That's not the reason for having a solid overlay. You could, they would stay adhered with a liquid overlay. The key is that you don't want the virus to be diffusing out of the infected cell. You want to restrict it so it forms a plaque. So here's a plaque assay from our lab. It's much better than Renato Dulbeco's, of course. We have better technology. You can see the nice range of dilution here. And remember, Renato in his paper said, from a single infection. These plaques arose from a single virus. So the question is, how many viruses do you need to form a plaque, and how did he figure that out? Well, it's actually quite simple to answer that question. What you do is a dose-response curve. You take, you take dilutions of virus, and you plate them out on cells, and you count the number of plaques. So in fact, when you do a plaque assay, you're, doing, you're always doing a dose-response curve, because you're varying uh, the dilution, and you're counting plaques. And so here is a graph of the results. So we have relative virus concentration on the x-axis. That's uh, the dilutions you make. And then we have the number of plaques on the y-axis. If you only need one virus to make a plaque, then that's one hit kinetics. The number of plaques is directly proportional to the first power of the concentration. In other words, when you double the concentration, you double the number of plaques. You get a straight line if you need just one virus to make a plaque. And for most viruses, in fact, that's what we see. A single virus particle is sufficient to form a plaque. And in fact, this experiment was in that paper of Dulbeco's, and that's why he could say in the title that these plaques arise from a single infectious virus. There are some viruses, though, where the genome is packaged in separate particles. One part of the genome is in one particle and another is in a separate. So you need two particles to get a successful infection to get a plaque. And when you do this experiment with those viruses, you get this blue curve, which is if you need two hits to get an infection, if you need two particles to get a plaque. And for two-hit kinetics, the number of plaques is proportional to the square of the concentration. That gives you the curve. And so that is... I guess it's good that Debeco didn't use one of these viruses to begin with because he might have concluded that you need more than one plaque, uh, one virus particle to make a plaque. There are some plant viruses, as you will see, that package the genome into separate particles. Now, the plaque assay is great not only for telling you the concentration of infectious viruses in a stock, but it will also allow you to, to do what we call plaque purification. You can take your plate when the plaques have grown out. Before you stain it, you, for many viruses, you can actually see the plaques with your eyes. And you can take a pipette and plunge it into the agar and purify all the virus derived from a single particle. And that's shown here. We used to do this three times sequentially to make sure that we have relatively pure we call them clonal virus stocks. So how are you sure that, like let's say you find one plaque that like two virus particles didn't lead to, like weren't mm -hmm. right next to each other? They could have, absolutely. That's, that's why we do plaque purification to make sure two viruses haven't by chance infected the same cell. Uh, 
so we can separate them. Yes, because that can happen. And often you'll see on plaque assays, you'll see overlapping plaques, which means two viruses infected very close to one another. Yeah. Now, there are other ways to measure infectivity that don't depend on a plaque assay. Another one, here's one uh, called the endpoint dilution assay. Uh, this depends on you being able to tell that a cell monolayer is infected. So what you do is you take multi-well plates full of your cells and you infect them with different dilutions of virus in, uh, in many replicates. So here would be a minus two dilution, minus three, minus four dilutions of virus, and then many replicas. And then you incubate them and, and you ask, at what dilution do I see cell killing? And more precisely, at what dilution do I see half of the cells killed? That's, a, that's one way of, of measuring this. We do it in infectivity 50% dose. So what you would do is, after, say, a week, you look at all of these wells and you score for cell killing, say, cytopathic <coughs> effects. And here you can see at the very low dilution, all the cells are dead. And that goes on and on. But eventually you get to a point, minus 5, where you get 50% of the wells infected. So we would say our tissue culture infectious dose 50% is 10 to the fifth, or probably 10 to the sixth because we put 0.1 mLs into that. So it's a relative way of, of assaying for infectivity of viruses. It doesn't tell you how many PFU there are in the stock, but it's a common way to measure infectivity. Now most of the time your 50% endpoint does not fall on a dilution. I did it conveniently for illustration, of course, but most of the time it falls between two dilutions, but there are mathematical ways to interpolate that, so that's not a problem. Another uh, interesting issue that arose after we developed the plaque assay uh, was this concept of how many, of all the virus particles in a, in a tube, how many of those are actually infectious? We call this the particle to PFU ratio, the number of physical particles divided by the number of infectious particles. Of course, if every particle in the tube were infectious, you'd have a particle to PFU ratio of one. And some viruses are uh, like that. Here, some leaky forest virus, an alpha virus, pretty much every particle is infectious. But for most animal viruses, it's not the case. Look at the papillomaviruses. For every 10,000 particles, only one is infectious. And the other viruses vary according to the different virus, 30 to 1,000 for some, 10 for others. You can see the numbers vary. So that's the particle to PFU ratio, the number of physical particles divided by the number of infectious particles. We learned just before that a single particle can initiate an infection and form a plaque, right? All you need for a plaque is a single infectious particle. But that doesn't tell you that all particles in a tube are infectious. And the only way you can do that is to do the particle to PFU ratio where you would have a stock, you would somehow count particles physically and then do a plaque assay. So not all viruses are successful at forming a plaque or infecting cells. And there are many reasons for this. There may be damaged particles in a preparation. There may be mutations. As you'll see, uh, viruses have high mutation rates. So there could be mutations spontaneously arising that uh, block infectivity. You know, the infectious cycle is complicated. You have to go through all these steps to get to new virus particles. And if you fail at any step, you don't make new virus particles. And this, of course, makes it hard to study viruses because if you infect a cell and you're looking at changes, how do you know that those changes are caused by, say, that one out of 10,000 viruses that is replicating or by just the mass of other non-infectious particles there. So we have to take that into account and figure out ways to get around that. All right, our next question. In particle to PFU ratio, particle can best be described as one of the proteins which makes up the virion, a virus which may or may not be infectious, a virus which is infectious, a virus which is not infectious, or elementary or composite. So the correct answer is B. When, when I say particle, I mean a virus that can or may or may not be infectious. And most of you got that, but a few of you got some of the others, which tells me you're, not all of you are clear on this. So when I say virus particle, it has no implication of infectivity. Can be, it might or might not be infectious. But when I say virion, 
I mean the infectious virus particle. All right, now that we know how to assay infectivity, let me t talk about one way that we can use this to study the infectious cycle. And this is what we call the one-step growth curve, which uh, we actually introduced last time very briefly, uh, a method to study the infectious cycle. And this was first developed in the 30s, again, by the phage biologists. And what you do here, you take your culture of bacteria, you add phage, you allow the phage to absorb. You do this in a small volume, so you drive the absorption. Then you dilute the culture, which stops all subsequent attachment of viruses, so you effectively synchronize the infection. And then at different times after infection, you take a sample and you ask how many infectious viruses are present. You can do that, of course, by a plaque assay. And that's a one-step growth cycle, and here is an example of that. So these are the data. On the left, uh, you would take your samples after infecting the bacteria with time, and you'd measure the number of infectious particles by plaque assay. And what you see uh, with, say, a bacteriophage infection of bacteria, there is a period where you don't see any new virus particles produced. No infectious virus particles produced. We call this the eclipse period. And then all of a sudden, at some point, could be hours or minutes after infection, depending on the virus, you then see the production of infectious viruses. And we call that the burst. And eventually, it plateaus when all the host cells are dead and no more virus can be produced. So that's a one-step growth cycle. And why is it one step? Because you've infected all the cells initially at the same time, we synchronize the infection by diluting the culture, and then all the cells are pretty much in the same part of the infectious cycle. And that's why everything happens at the same time, the eclipse period, the burst, and the plateau. Now, if you dilute the virus and put much less virus on, you get multi-step growth cycles. So if you put a lot less virus on, you'll still have an eclipse period. You'll get a first burst, but not all the cells will be infected because you've put on less virus then those viruses that are produced will infect the next group of cells and you'll get your second burst. And you can imagine if you diluted enough, if you put one virus particle in the cells, you would get many bursts. And there are experimental reasons why we would want to have a one cycle or a multi-cycle growth cycle. So this is for bacteriophages. Of course, the animal virologists adapted this to their viruses later. And this is a uh, one-step growth cycle for an animal virus called adenoviruses, and these are adenoviruses here. We'll talk about these quite a bit uh, during this course. They are rather large DNA-containing viruses. And again, you take cells in culture, monolayer cells, you infect them at a high amount of virus. All the cells are infected. And then you dilute the culture after a certain period of absorption, and you let the cells become infected. You can see there is an eclipse period here. And then at about 12 hours, you start to see virus production. Now in this experiment, we have gotten a little more granular with the experiments. And we have measured two different things. We have measured virus released from cells and the virus that's inside of cells. Okay, so the yellow or orange curve is the released virus. So you take a sample of the cell culture supernatant, you measure virus in that. And then for the uh, intracellular virus, you have to remove the medium, scrape up the cells, and measure the virus within them. So obviously for this, you need to have multiple uh, replicates for each time point. And when you do that, you see the eclipse period means this is when virus particles are first synthesized inside of the cell. But they're not released for another four hours. And that's because it takes time for the virus particles to get where they're made in the cell to eventually get out. So the part of the cycle where we see no infectivity anywhere inside the cell or out, that's called the eclipse period. And what's happening there is that the genome of the virus has gotten in the cell. It needs to be transcribed to mRNA, it has to be made into proteins, Proteins have to be assembled into particles. It all takes time. That's why there's a lag. And the time from beginning of infection to where we first see viruses outside of the cell is called the latent period. Now, we would have seen these two phases in the bacteriophage experiment that I just showed you. 
but they didn't do the experiment that way. They just took total cells and looked for virus infectivity. So only when you fractionate the medium from the cells do you see this difference between intracellular and extracellular viruses. And I just want to emphasize that this is very different from the way bacteria multiply, as we said last time. If you take a single bacterium and put it in, put it in broth, it will immediately start to divide by binary fission. There's no eclipse period, and it will divide until the medium is exhausted. That's not the case with viruses because they have to get inside of cells and make all of the parts to make new particles, and that just takes time. Now, another key point, which I mentioned, but I want to emphasize about these one-step growth curves. You have to synchronize the infection. You have to make sure all the cells are infected and go through the whole infectious cycle at the same time. And to do that, as I said, we have to make sure we infect all the cells. So how do we do that? So that depends on another parameter that I want to tell you about, and that is the multiplicity of infection, MOI. You'll see this quite often in the first half of this course. It's a very simple concept. It's the number of infectious particles that you add for every cell in your dish. So it's the PFU divided by the number of cells. For example, let's not, if you take 10 to the seventh virus particles and you have a million cells that you add those to, you have an MOI of 10. That's what the MOI is. It does not mean that each cell receives 10 virus particles. You have given each cell 10 virus particles, but you'll see in a moment, in fact, not every cell will get 10. So it's, it is the number of particles you add, not the number of particles each cell actually receives. All right, it's a really important distinction. So here's the way I like to look at it. When you add virus to a plate of cells, the infection is depending on random collisions between those virus particles and the cells. And so some cells will get no virus particles, some will get one, some will get two or more. And the distribution has been studied and it has been concluded that the number of particles that each cell will get can be described by the Poisson distribution. And we'll look at the equation in a moment that describes that. But the way I like to look at it is say if you have a bucket or a box of tennis balls and you had a lot of buckets sitting in front of you and you just dumped the box onto the buckets, you, each bucket would not get the same number of balls, right? Some would get none, some would get one, some would get a couple. It's the same thing with adding viruses to cells. Since it's a chance event, you can have a whole range of uh, virus particles getting into each cell and that, that exact range is described by the Poisson distribution. So we have a formula that describes that and in this course this lecture is the only one where you will see math. So if you hate math and I'm sure some of you don't do, uh, you can get past this lecture because after this there's no more. But this is the formula for the Poisson distribution as it applies to cells infected by viruses. And it's PK equals E minus M, MK over K factorial. Where PK is the fraction of cells infected by K virus particles. And that's what you want to know. M is the multiplicity of infection. How many viruses you add per cell. So you, we can actually simplify this, which is shown here, because uninfected cells is P0. K, K would be zero, that's simply e to the minus m. And cells that get one particle, P1 is m e to the minus m, where m is the multiplicity. You could plug in whatever multiplicity you'd like there. Uh, and m, of course, in this formula is also the multiplicity. And then finally, uh, cells that are multiply infected, getting more than one particle, are, are determined by this formula here, which is one, which is the sum of all the probabilities for any value of k, that would be one, and you subtract from it the probabilities p0 and p1. There's p0 and uh, there's p1. Let's, it's separated out in this formula. So that's a very simple way to figure out if you add one or five or 10 PFU per cell, that's an MOI of one, five or 10, how many particles each cell will get. And here are some examples to kind of illustrate this. So if you have a million cells, 
and you infect them at a multiplicity of 10, only 45 cells are uninfected. Uh, 450 will get more than one particle, and the rest will get more, uh, will receive one, sorry, and the rest will receive more than one. So this is nice because you now know that if you want to infect every cell in a culture and do a one-step growth curve, you do an MOI of 10. Turns out it will also work at an MOI of 5. Uh, but if you use an MOI of 1, 37% of the cells are uninfected. 37% get one particle and 26% receive more than one. So there, you're going to get multi-step cycles, growth cycles, because in that first cycle only uh, a fraction of the cells are going to be infected, the 37 plus 27%. And finally, if you do a really low MOI, 0.001, 0.001 virus particles per cell. Okay, very simple to figure out. 99% of the cells are uninfected. 0.099% uh, get one, and a very small amount get more than one. So here you would have multi cycles of infection because very few cells are initially infected. So this is how we figure out that our cells are either completely infected or not. Now, so in, pr in practice, what we do in the lab is when we want a high MOI, we use 10, and when we want low, we can use 0.1 or 0.001. We don't have to use this formula on a daily basis, but it, it tells you the basis for the idea of how it works. Okay, the next question. If cells are infected at an MOI of 10 in a one-step growth experiment, the growth curve, you will likely see multiple bursts of viruses, multiple eclipse periods, a single burst of virus release, no burst, asynchronous infection. Of course, the right answer is C. You're going to get a single burst because you did a high MOI infection, all the cells are infected. You're not going to get multiple bursts. You will only do that at a low MOI like 1 or 0 0.001. Asynchronous is basically multiple burst, so you're not going to get that either. Single burst, synchronous infection. So we've talked a lot about infectivity measurements and what you can do with them. There are also physical ways of measuring virus particles. As I said, for those who work with viruses where you cannot measure infectivity, you have to do this instead. And these include, some things we'll talk about, others not, hemagglutination, measuring particles using red blood cells electron microscopy. Of course, nobody is really going to measure their viruses using electron microscopy, but in the old days it was done. We can actually measure enzymes that are incorporated into virus particles. Not all en viruses have enzymes in the particle, but some do, and we can measure them. We can use antibodies to measure virus particles, and we can measure nucleic acids in a number of ways. So let's go through a few of these. Hemagglutination is done for Viruses like influenza viruses, measles viruses, where the receptor for the virus turns out to be a sugar that's present on red blood cells, just fortuitously. These viruses don't infect red blood cells, of course. Uh, in mammals, they don't have a nucleus. Uh, but you can use the binding to measure the amount of virus you have. So the, the principle is you have red blood cells which you can purchase and, and clean up and you mix them with virus, and the virus will bind to the red blood cell. And if multiple viruses bind to the red blood cell, which will be at a high concentration, then the red blood cells are going to stick to each other, because each one is coated with virus, and they will f stick to each other. And they'll form a nice lattice. And the way you measure this is very simple. You do this assay in a 96-well plate. You fill it with red blood cells, and then you add your virus different dilutions, so a 1 to 4, 1 to 8, etc. These are dilutions of the virus you've mixed with the red blood cells. And you let the thing sit for 30 minutes. If there's no virus in your sample, all the red blood cells will tumble to the bottom of the well, and you'll get these nice buttons. See that? So this top sample has no virus in it, because all the dilutions have buttons. On the bottom, we see some nice, uh, we see no buttons for a while. You can see a nice lattice at all these dilutions, maybe up to uh, one, in, 1 to 1,024. And that's because there's virus in there. Eventually, you dilute it out, and you get a button. So you would say the HA, the hemagglutination titer for this virus is, let's call it 512, because I see a button there at 1024. 
Now you may ask, why is there a button in well one? Well, the, the virus actually has an enzyme in the particle that cleaves off the link between the red blood cell and the virus. And that's why at high concentrations of virus, you don't see hemagglutination. And we'll, you may want to know why, and we'll talk about that later. So hemagglutination is a very quick way to measure the number of particles. It doesn't tell you anything about infectivity, of course, just the number of particles. You can measure enzymes, as I said. Uh, many viruses have enzymes in them. One family, the retroviruses, have a reverse transcriptase that can turn RNA into DNA. We'll talk about that in great detail. You can measure it. You can take these particles. Say you have a tube of what you think are retroviruses, and you want to measure enzyme activity. You can add a detergent to, to lightly break open the particles. Then you add substrates for the enzyme, nucleoside triphosphates, a template, and a primer. And then you can measure the activity of the enzyme. And so here's an example where you take cell supernatants. This is mock infected cells, and here are cells infected with a virus called XMRV, undiluted 1 to 10. And at different days after infection, you are measuring the activity of the enzyme by this dot blot format. And you can see that starting around day three, you get very nice uh, enzyme activity. And this is routinely used to, to measure retroviruses because you can't do plaque assays uh, with them. Of course, you can use antibodies to do all sorts of things to measure virus. Here are two different ways to use enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays. You can look for viral antigens or viral antibodies. And there are situations where you'd want to do either. When you first go for a HIV test, they will do an ELISA on your serum and look for antigens. They will actually do two different tests, and one of them will be an ELISA looking for antigens. If you want to know how many people in this room have been infected with a virus, you can take your blood and look for viral antibodies in the blood. So two different things you're looking for. And that's what's shown here. You have a plastic, typically a 96-well format. In one case, you could put some antibody on the plastic, an antibody specific for one of your viral proteins. And then you can put your sample on these plates. Any antigen, any viral antigen that's present in the sample will be captured by the bound antibody. And then you can add a second antibody with an indicator of some kind to detect the bound protein. So here we're looking for viral antigens. You can also look for viral antibodies. In this case, you put a viral protein on the plastic support. And then you take a serum sample, you add it to the plastic. If there are antibodies to the viral antigens, they will bind. And then you can, again, use a second antibody with an indicator to try and detect those bound antibodies. These are very versatile and powerful methods, which are not only used in the lab, but they're also used in you know, rapid diagnostic situations, in point of care situations, clinical laboratories, and for epidemiological studies as well. And you, if you've gone for uh, office tests, many of them are done in a dipstick format. Of course, the first one developed in this way was a pregnancy test. But now, when you go for a rapid influenza test, they'll take a little nasal wash from you. They will apply it to a pre-made uh, pad, shown here, on which are embedded antibodies to influenza virus proteins. And the clinical specimen will put at one, be put at one end. And this is an absorbent pad on the top, so it will wick the, the sample across the, the pad by capillary flow. And if there are um, uh, antigens, in this case, which we're looking for, that have bound the antibodies, they will be captured here, and uh, they will show up as positive. And these always are containing positive controls so that you make sure that the assay is working. So you have a test line and a control line. And these are ELISAs, basically. This is a modified ELISA format using uh, antibodies to a, a particular antigen. And these have revolutionized uh, diagnostics and epidemiology in many situations. Green fluorescent protein has been developed as another powerful way to study virus infections. As you know, green fluorescent protein originally identified from jellyfish there's the protein right there. The original version was green, but we've made all sorts of colors now by changing the protein. 
and you can make five, six, seven different colors in one experiment. Uh, here, the main panel here, these are cells infected with, I think, five different herpes viruses, each a different color. And you can see that by the color of the cells, all the different green fluorescent protein colors. And this particular experiment was done to ask how many different viruses can infect a single cell. We can also now visualize in a fluorescent microscope, which is basically a light microscope with fluorescent optics, we can visualize single virus particles. Because if you incorporate green fluorescent protein into the virus particle itself, it will now fluoresce under UV light, and its size is big enough to be detected by light microscopy. And that's what's shown here. This is a cell infected with GFP labeled HIV, and each of those green dots is a single HIV particle. And those red lines, these are the microtubules of the cell. So this was stained with an antibody against tubulin. It's, it's colored red. And you can track the movement of the particle along the microtubule network. So you can track single virus particle movement uh, into and out of cells. And the, the kinds of experiments you can do, which we'll touch on in this course, are remarkable. Polymerase chain reaction is another big revolution in virology. As you know, this is a, a way that you can detect very small quantities of nucleic acids. It can be either DNA or RNA. The assay uses an enzyme that was uh, extracted from a bacteria first discovered in the 1960s by Thomas Brock, who was a microbiologist who was interested in understanding what bacteria grew in hot springs like this one. It made all those cool colors. He used to go to Yellowstone and sample bacteria. And uh, one of the bacteria, Thermus aquaticus, that he purified many years later, people extracted a heat-resistant DNA polymerase, which is what's used for these assays. And I love this story because he was just curious. He wanted to know what grew in this hot water. And from that discovery came a, a procedure which has completely revolutionized research, diagnosis, and industrial production of products. I mean, almost every virus infection now can be diagnosed by PCR. And we use it all the time in the laboratory for many, many different purposes. And the way it works, of course, is you have some DNA, you denature it, you add primers, and you use the thermostable polymerase to make products. You now have two copies of the original. You then denature those and redo the reaction, and you have four, and then you have eight, and 16. You have exponential growth of products. So starting from just a few molecules, you can make lots and lots and lots. So this, again, has been another really amazing, powerful tool. However, it's not without caveats. Because what we are detecting here, of course, is nucleic acid. And of course, same thing goes for uh, the antibody studies I told you about. We're detecting proteins. We're not detecting infectivity. And here's an experiment. It was published in 2017 uh, during the Zika uh, scare globally, which shows that PCR products are not the same as infectious virus. So in this, in this uh, experiment, they were looking for replication of Zika virus in uh, male testes. And they infect mice with Zika virus. And then at different times uh, after infection, uh, these are days after infection, they measure infectious Zika virus in seminal fluids. So you, and this is by plaque assay, right? So the red line, you can see a nice peak of virus. And then after 21 or 22 days, there's no more infectious virus in the seminal fluids of these mice. But if you do PCR to look for Zika virus RNA in the seminal fluids, it persists beyond 60 days. But that's not infectious virus. So the question is, should we worry about that? And the CDC says yes, and that's why they recommend if you've been to a Zika endemic place, you have to wait six months before having sex with the idea of having kids, because you don't want to transmit this to the fetus. But uh, you know, this clearly shows that PCR products are small fragments of viral RNA, clearly not the same as infectious virus. And I just want you to remember that because many people assume it's the same thing. Many people assume that a PCR positive uh, 
result means that you have infectious virus when it can't. There's no way it can mean that because you're amplifying small pieces of the genome. Another and final uh, technology that has completely revolutionized biology and, and virology, of course, is deep, high throughput sequencing. The ability to sequence many, many nucleic acids at very high coverage and very thoroughly. And this allows us to do metagenomics. It allows us to take a sample of pond water and sequence everything in it, all the nucleic acids in it, and find out what is in it. And I, I've been uh, going to some high school events over the last few years where high school students in the city, uh, it's called the barcode something or other, they have projects based, based on deep sequencing. For example, they'll go to pond water and s sequence it and see what's in it. One study was really cool. They went to sushi restaurants all over New York and they took a little bit of sushi home and sequenced it and they found out that one restaurant was selling salmon and it wasn't really salmon because you can tell by sequencing uh, the DNA of that fish. So this has totally revolutionized biology and you know, it allows us to identify new viruses, new pathogens. The human genome was first sequenced you know, 10 years ago. It cost $3 billion. You can have your genome sequenced now for less than $1,000. It's all because of this technology. Now, when I was a postdoc, I sequenced the genome of poliovirus, 7,442 bases. It was the first animal virus sequence. It took me one year to do that because we didn't have deep, high-throughput sequencing. Do you know how long it would take to do that today? 10 minutes. <laughs> I would put it in an envelope, send it to a company, and they would do it really in 10 minutes. That's how this technology is so powerful. It is just Amazing. So this is the way I sequenced polio, by running gels and reading the sequence by hand, typing it into a computer. But it's now all automated so that you can do multiple runs at a time on many, many samples. This is just amazing uh, what's been done with it. So this has totally revolutionized many aspects of virology. And people discover viruses all the time by deep sequencing. Here are two uh, TWIV episodes where we talk to people or about discovery of new viruses. Here's a group at UCSF where they discovered a new virus causing disease in snakes. By sequencing diseased snakes, they could see that there was a virus sequence in it that was common to all of them, and they discovered a new virus. Uh, on the right is a, a, a relatively new virus isolated with people with severe febrile illness who apparently were bitten by ticks. And this is a new tick-borne virus that, uh, again, was discovered by deep sequencing. Now again, when you sequence a viral genome or a serum sample from a patient, you get bits of sequence from all over the genome. You never get the whole thing at once. So you don't have infectious virus. If you want to prove that there's infectious virus present, you have to do much more. So let me leave you with this last story, which is that many people like to smuggle animal parts in from different countries. And you've, these are all confiscated at JFK and Newark Airport. And uh, you can see they're, they're kept here. And uh, a lab at Columbia, Ian Lipkin's lab, decided to sequence some of these and see what viruses were present. So they did PCR and high throughput sequencing. And they found lots of different viral sequences in them. Um, there was a New York Times article on this. From jungle to JFK, viruses cross borders in monkey meat. And I would argue that the headline is wrong. You're not showing that viruses are crossing the border. You're showing that viral sequences, because none of these studies have shown infectious viruses in them, just little pieces of nucleic acid. So that's the thing you have to be careful about. Don't conflate sequence with infectious virus. So on Wednesday, we'll talk about viral genomes and what we can do with them.